sorry. With all this information that we have, as Alex uh, introduced, uh, how can we then go down to the regional scale and try to do an assessment that is really local and what do we mean for assessment at the regional scale? So just to <clears throat> uh, bring you to the methodology on how this uh, was done, uh, let's start with uh, another thing that was unique for this uh, uh, latest assessment. This is the, for the first time we can use uh, the word un uh, une unequivocal. So it's unequivocal that the human activity are causing climate change. We can do this now because we have more evidence, we have longer observational record, we have better model, and we have much more process understanding. So you start to see that these things come together, they are important, and uh, it makes us to move from the, okay, from what, what it used to be in the past. So this is a little bit of the history of the terminology that was going on from the first assessment report until now. So you see that in the first assessment report, the humankind is capable. In the second is uh, the balance suggested additional human influence on global climate is there. On the third, we started with the likely confidence interval um, expression of the um, confidence we have in assessing that the human is contributing to the change and we move to the very likely, extremely likely, now we are to the unequivocal. So we made a step forward and the other step forward we made is that we could write something like that, that climate change is already affecting every region on Earth in multiple ways and this change will be proportional to the warming. But how do, do we really do that? How can we say this is the first time that we can really assess the change on each of the region and we need to have a methodology. The methodology is, uh, is uh, represented in these uh, uh, figures here and exactly what we need to be able to go a such, uh, um, a such uh, high resolution scale, let's say, we need to take into consideration to construct the information together with the stakeholder and to take into consideration many of the things. So we need to evaluate the observational data we have, the model, the literature, to understand what is happening. Then we need to synthesize all this information. Then we need to uh, create some distilled climate information. And then we need to uh, try to deliver this information through data, so un un uh, by um, estimating the uncertainty we have, we need to use a storyline if it's needed. I mean, if we want to tell what is the worst case scenario and how likely it is, we can use something like storyline and then we can use a good graphic. All this information has to be user oriented and has to be co-produced with the user. So to use a nice sketch from Catherine that you will meet this week, this is what we do. We need to condensate this multiple line of evidence coming from multiple sources and try to get a final assessment. So let's uh, cut down this in uh, pieces and see how we actually did. So the first step for us, for all of us working in this process, was to collect the information for each, what we call, line of evidence. So we were asking ourselves for a specific region in the world that could be South America, East Asia, Africa, North America, do we have enough observation of this specific CID we want to study? And if yes, for example, we do, do we have an attribution study that is telling us that what the observation are showing is due to the uh, human uh, activity? And do we have a projection? And which kind of projection do we have? Once the first step is done, then we move to the second one. And then we assess each of the line of evidence. So the confidence, the final confidence, is obtained from the expert judgment, but the expert judgment has to take into account all the three line of evidence that we mentioned before. So for example, do we need to ask ourselves, do the observed trend agree? Are they significant? Do they cover the same period that is very relevant, for example, for variable like the precipitation? Are the past trend attributable to the human activity? And are these consistent with what we observe? And then, last 
and not least, do the model projection agree? And then are these change that we see significant for this region? If we, can, if we are able to say, <coughs> to assess all of this, then we can trace all this process in a fantastic traceback matrix that was just a nightmare for us, in which for each region we tried to uh, note exactly which was the line of evidence which were the line of evidence we were using and which was the confidence for each of them. And then we finally performed the assessment by using some of the table like the one that Alex showed before. But exactly what does it mean? So let's try to understand how this process work. I mean, how do we assess this line of evidence? Let's start from the observation. Do we have observed trend. We have observed trend and we can use a different kind of source. We have global data set, for example, this is an observed trend from the, for the precipitation. We have regional data set, this is temperature, and this is again precipitation. How can we reconcile the two? So one is coming from the global, one is coming from the regional. The data set are different, are they telling us the same things? If yes, if there is a kind of confidence, then we can say yes, it's significant. If not, we have to, to be able to say it's not significant, so I cannot use this information in my assessment. Then the second step is the attribution. What does it mean to have something attributed to the, um, to the, the, the human activity? So let's think to have some PDF, like a distribution of events that belong to the past. And then think that in some, suddenly, in a certain <coughs> point of time, you have, okay, you have, sorry, the past, and then you can have a future. Then, in a certain point of time, something happened that just follow over there. But it's happening today, like, for example, the flood, there have been a recent very high damaging flood in Italy. There are many usually in the fall season and everywhere else, in Bangladesh and everywhere else. So if these events happen, how can we say if these events belong to the past or to the future? So this is the question we need to answer. So we need to create a framework by which we create a factual and counterfactual words, and we analyze these two words in a way that we can then attribute these events. There are several ways to do this work. This is just an example for you. If you're curious, you can use methods that are called analog methods. So you go and look some atmospheric analog for the specific events. So this is one specific event. This is the Mediterranean heat peak on August 2021. So this is, for example, the um, mean sea level pressure field. This is the temperature, and this is the um, uh, the, total, uh, the total precipitation, I think. And, and this, basically, if I take these events, I will look for analog in the past. So I will divide my period, the observed period I have in two. I will look for analog in the past and in the more near future. I make the difference between the two and try to assess how significant is the difference. Like, for example, in this case, the difference in temperature corresponding to this atmospheric part is quite significant and positive. But we can also use another method, like a stati more statistical method, for which we have a time series of some observable, one CID, for example, precipitation. This is an example for the Liguria extreme precipitation in 2021. We make the same um, game. We divide our time series in two. So, and we call it the factual and counterfactual world, where the factual world is the world where you live now, the counterfactual is the world of the past. Then <coughs> we use the extreme value theory, we fit our time series, and we see how it's changing a return period of a specific event, and if this change is significant. If this is significant, this means that these events, although it's happening uh, in the today world, but it's due to the action of the, to the human action, so that the warm is, is due to global warming. Okay, then we can put all these things together as, as we have done in the IPCC and then create those uh, observed, mapped, and attributed 
for which we have uh, three, for example, CAD, the heat extreme, the heavy precipitation, and the drought for each of the region of the world. So the hexagon are the region. This is the mad region where we are today. And for each of these, we can see if the trend is significant or not. So if the region is colored, the trend is significant. If you have one, two, or three dot, you have different uh, confidence for the attribution of these events. We can use all this information and then move to the process understanding and climate projection. So once we have the observation, the attribution, what about the projection? Can we uh, understand why our climate model are telling us that, for example, in the uh, South, Southeast South America region, there will be an increase of precipitation in the future? So these are the projections coming from the global model, from the regional model. What do I do? I need to use all of them. I need to reconcile this with the observation. I need to have a mechanism, an understanding of what is happening there. If I have all the three of them, together with the attribution, hopefully, then I can be sure that this signal, what I see projected in the past, in the future, it's uh, uh, with high confidence. So it's very likely that we, this uh, will be the projected path. I can do this also for another region like the Mediterranean, same story. I have my observation. This is uh, the example for the Mediterranean summer warning. I can use my the observation. The observation are telling me that uh, the Mediterranean is uh, the, the trend in the Mediterranean is uh, of warming is in summer. It's quite uh, evident. Then I can use. Uh, I can look and see if the model can reproduce this trend. Are the model and the observation agreeing on this trend? I can build the heat map here, see how the distribution looks like. And then, do I have a process that explains why is this happening? Yes, I do. In this case, so I can sketch out which is the process that I, I see that the influence of the warm Atlantic Ocean, the, there is a, the influence of the warm Atlantic Ocean, the reduction of the aerosol, the drying of the surface, that is a positive feedback. I can put all this together, and then I can say, OK, this signal is real. So there is high confidence that I can come up with the final assessment saying that there is high confidence that in the Mediterranean region, as experienced a summer temperature increase in recent decade, that is faster than the increase for the North Hemisphere summer mean. And also there is a high confidence that this will keep going on with the global when the global warming level will rise. This is the procedures that we have followed for each of the region, but also we made the, uh, the step to use not only the time horizon as a, uh, as, a, um, as a methodology, but also the global warming level horizon. So if I have a signal, so if I have the global mean temperature that is rising, and then I have several scenarios, I can see when, for example, for a specific scenario, I'm crossing a certain level of global warming level, the 1.5 or the 2. And this, of course, will be in a different window, either closer to us or far away from us. So I can use, instead of the time reference, the global warming reference. I can do this because I can track for each of the global warming model, uh, from the global for each of the global model, which is the gro crossing time uh, of the specific global warming level. And I can use this uh, new uh, reference framework to uh, build my assessment. If I do this, then I come up with the final finding that was, uh, um, that was our uh, regional assessment um, point for the SPM, in which we say that with further global warming, every region is projected to increase, increasingly experience concurrent multiple change in climatic impact driver. Change in several climatic impact driver will be more widespread at two degree compared to one degree, and even more widespread for higher warming. So then we can summarize this in some table that are the one that Alex already explained, connecting each CID with each, with, with each of the region for all the parts of the words. And then finally, we can handle this information as from working group two, just ready to the group, from, from working group one to the working group two. Why is this not working? No, okay, sorry, <laughs> it was that. 
So we move, okay, the animation wasn't working, it was just the handling, handling of the information from the working group one to the working group two, and then this gives a nice introduction for the following talk that will come, but after coffee. Thank you, that's fun. Any questions?